I mean, I, I'll probably give folks another minute or so. We'll start with uh, 1202 and then we'll, we'll see how it goes. Sounds good. I could edit out the, the dead space at the start, so no problem. All right, folks, we have about 12.02 uh, this afternoon on Thursday, the 8th of October. Thanks very much, much for joining. Um, I'm Ivo Dinov here. Um, I'm faculty in health behavior and biological sciences and computational medicine and bioinformatics. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, present today um, a, a technology um, a seminar. So uh, I appreciate your joining. I know it's lunchtime. Um, you probably have better uh, ways to spend your time, but um, I, I will try to uh, make it to the best of my ability worthwhile. So um, my plan today is to speak about space time analytics, and we usually do these things in person, but now we're online. So I will try to at least break every 15 minutes or so to see if there is any questions uh, from the audience. So by the way, in the chat, you, you can find the slide. We just do Google search soccer news, go to today's event, and, and you're going to find the PDF. And, and all the things that I'm going to be showing and the demos uh, and so forth are going to be um, uh, shown um, on this website. So very quickly on that line, uh, I, I'll start. So, so my goal would be to essentially spend about half the time, uh, not really lecturing, but presenting the foundations. And then I want to get into the point where we actually show you how these very deep, you know, uh, scientific and philosophical concepts materialize uh, when it comes to data analytics. So I'm going to start by uh, formulating a few of the big data analytics challenges. Then I'm going to spend a little bit of time. It, it, look, it is important. It's a new concept for most of you. Uh, what, what is time? What's complex time? Something that we call time. Uh, what is space time analytics? Uh, what is the mathematical foundations and so forth? I will not go too deep, I promise. Um, but the reason why I want to kind of very quickly glance through, so, so you, you have the, the, the slides uh, on the website and you, you can download them and actually go over the details. And if anybody is interested in, uh, I can send you a preprint of the book. Uh, and, then, and then I'm going to go over the R package that we are developing in parallel with the mathematical theory. Uh, that's called TCIU, Time Complexity and Inferential Uncertainty. And then we're going to do some demos, hands-on. That's the plan. So let, let's start off in the beginning. You know, what are, what are some of these challenges? Uh, okay, so pardon my uh, little uh, experimentation here with the red lines. Uh, I, I try to see how the um, annotation engine works here in, in PowerPoint. So. Um, uh, we, I have looked at, at a number of uh, different uh, case studies, uh, not only in biomedicine and health, but in environment, econ, and various other disciplines. And the seven common characteristics that occur over, over time, over and over again, are the following. These data sets are large. We all know that. They're very complex in terms of their representation, uh, 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 you know, um, in, in terms of their uh, storage representation and, and heterogeneity. They're very incongruent, um, which uh, makes the problem of uh, aggregating and harmonizing them uh, challenging. Uh, most of the time, they're, they're arriving from independent sources that are not intended to uh, uh, necessarily interoperate. Uh, very often, they're multi-scale, which means that the data is viewed, the same data objects are viewed through some kind of a prism uh, the way we decompose white light into the spectrum of the rainbow spectrum, that's exactly what's happening. But many data sets are high, low, uh, medium, and, and micro and nanoscale resolution. Uh, very often, they have a longitudinal dimension to them, so, so, so they are uh, varying with time, and they're never complete. So these seven characteristics I typically use as my uh, you know, uh, yardstick to, to measure, does the data require any special uh, treatment or, or can it just be plugged in and, and processed in, in a standard way. Just to give you a little bit more of a 
pragmatic focus, we are going to be talking uh, quite substantially about uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. And uh, these fMRIs, so here's a little animation that we've done. Uh, fMRI is essentially a four-dimensional uh, data object that has three spatial dimensions and one longitudinal dimension. And the state-of-the-art approaches uh, essentially use either time series analysis or some kind of a network-based analysis to interpret the various stimuli that are applied to the brain and then uh, tr try to understand how do they affect brain physiology, structure, function, diffusion, and so forth. In our world, we, we're going to be uh, uh, extending this notion of time into um, uh, complex time, which leads very naturally to these time series, which we're all very accustomed to viewing. These, these time series, they're going to become actually a two-dimensional manifolds, which have very intricate structure, and we're going to call these manifolds time surfaces. So, and, and just to give you a little bit of, a, again, a, a pictorial view of what is the distinction between these two classical space-time analytics and the, and the space-time analytics, you know, if you have a, an object where you ignore the second dimension of time, you may be looking at an isocontour of a two-dimensional fMRI slice across time that kind of looks like this. We're just tracking the isocontours. So, so these are isosurfaces across time. Whereas if you factor in the correct um, second uh, dim two-dimensional um, time representation, you get a lot more detail, as you can see in this uh, snapshot. So let's go ahead and now define a little bit about what is this time and, and how does it come into play. Now, most of us have seen the Fourier transformation. I'm not going to spend too much time here. We can go from space to frequency and back. And by the way, most of the uh, functional magnetic resonance data is acquired in K space in the Fourier domain and then it's inverted in the time domain so that we can actually see it. I'll just show you one, one little example here. And uh, because this is a static image, everybody can actually see this example. We, we did this over 15 years ago. Oops, pardon me. Um, right up here. So you, you basically, with your mouse, you can go ahead and actually draw some kind of a signal. It needs to be periodic signal, OK, uh, for the obvious reasons. And now it, uh, this thing kind of decomposes for you directly the signal into the um, magnitudes, the, the, the Fourier magnitudes, and then the phases, okay? So these are very important. You see, if I bring the mouse over any one of these components, it, 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 it will tell me precisely, you see, when I, as I move the mouse about, you see the yellow curve on the top kind of shows me the effect of this phase, this phase, or this magnitude, right? And I can perturb my signal a little bit by changing either a magnitude or a phase, right? And I can manipulate the data, right, and see the exact effect. So it is very important to understand that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this signal and the corresponding Fourier decomposition of this um, uh, of this data. So um, to, to to make the problem a little bit more interesting, kind of go, diving deeper a little bit in in this notion of of the phases. Uh, I'll consider two examples. So imagine if I have a two-dimensional image of a square and a disk, and then I pipe them through the Fourier transform and compute um, uh, both the real part of the Fourier transform and then the magnitude, which we saw in the one-dimensional time curve a little bit earlier. And then here is the corresponding phases, because I have, in this case, not a one-dimensional, but a two-dimensional signal where the intensities are black and white, very, 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 very simple kind of characteristic function, uh, but the, the, the representation of the domain of the magnitudes and the phases would be exactly on the same kind of grid, except that it's obviously in the frequency space. You do exactly the same thing for the disk. And now the trick that I'm going to play is I'm going to try to recover back the original images from their magnitude and phase decompositions with a twist. In these images right up here that you can see where, where there is aliasing artifacts, I'm going to be completely setting the, um, I'm going to be swapping. I'm going to be using the phases of the disk and the magnitude of the square to reconstruct the square here. And I'm going to be using the magnitude of the disk here, the correct magnitude, but the incorrect magnitude of the phase. And you can see what you get. Now, at the same time, if you completely negate, if you completely zero out these phases and you reconstruct the images into space-time image domain, you're going to get these objects. 
And arguably, this does look like a disk. This topologically looks like a square, but it's, it's not quite a square, right? OK, so the point I'm trying to get across is that the phase representations make a huge difference. And now, obviously, if I'm going to be making inference on objects like this where I ignore the phases, I'm probably going to be getting somewhat different uh, predictions, forecasts, and, and so forth. So it was over about 100 years ago when uh, a mathematician and a physicist, uh, Theodore Kaluza and Oscar Klein, uh, put together this theory about uh, a five-dimensional space-time. Uh, space they were essentially trying to, uh, to, to generalize um, Einstein's theory of relativity, where they um, uh, introduced an extra fifth dimension, which was time-like dimension. It was not a space-like dimension. And their idea was that this dimension is, is very, very, very small, okay? So it's so tiny that you cannot traverse it, but it does include a perfect orientation or a face representation. So in other words, you can see this gridding here that I've, that I've drawn illustrates uh, the, the, you know, essentially the Planck distance. You, know, you cannot see anything between this line and this line because it's below the Planck constant, okay? So, however, you have these directions that are non-traversable, but the, the uh, Kaluza-Klein theory was that, you know, you're looking at Minkowski space time, the, the standard space, um, and then you cross this, you, uh, you multiply this by an S1 object to account for these unobservable phases. So, in our world, we're going to be defining time as a complex time which has a magnitude r, and this r is going to be exactly the, or the longitudinal order of events that we refer to as time, but we're going to have an extra phi here, and this phi captures the phase of time, okay? So you can imagine now here in this three-dimensional rendering, I've compressed the three spatial dimensions into a single flat line, and then I have swapped it perpendicularly, a two-dimensional plane, which I'm going to be representing in polar coordinates, as you can see here, where the R coordinate is essentially our intuitive measure of time, and the phase measure is this direction of time that allows us to um, represent objects that are taken at the, at the same space and time location. We have multiple instances, and they span the distribution of the phases. So there is multiple ways that this can be represented mathematically. I'm not going to go over all of this, but this ultimately leads to a space-time manifold, okay, which um, obviously can be defined uh, very synergistically to how the Minkowski space-time manifold is, is defined. And then there is obviously a metric tensor for the Euclidean flat space-time. The metric tensor has signature plus, plus, plus for a spatial, for the three spatial dimensions, and minus one, minus one, for the corresponding to um, time-like uh, dimensions. So this all leads very naturally to an extension of the standard Newton-Leibniz calculus of integration and differentiation to space-time calculus. And you know you can define first order, second order derivatives. They obviously are defined in terms of Wertinger differentiation. Okay, and then uh, this obviously leads to um, definition, right? The opposite operation of uh, uh, differ uh, differentiation is integration. You want to you want to have a fundamental theorem of calculus proven. So we've gone over these things. This can be done very nicely. You can generalize the Newton's equation of motion, which are in space-time listed like this. They they generalize very naturally into this higher dimensional space. And then, uh, and then what we have is we can generalize a whole bunch of other things, like what are Lorentz transformations that are preserving uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the square interval, the, the interval in space-time. Uh, these are transformations that essentially preserve uh, distances in this high-dimensional space. And there is a whole bunch of other generalizations. I'll just mention one here. Uh, the notion that we can actually solve PDEs, we can solve partial differential equations like the wave equation in these higher dimensional uh, uh, lift spaces. Uh, and, and this is just a, a small rendering. I'm not sure how uh, clear or visible this is on the, on the projection screen. But you can see I have um, just a reduced two spatial dimensions. These are the x and y. Then the vertical axis goes from 
uh, from uh, from uh, minus pi to pi for the phase, and then the dynamics of this system are across our natural intuitive temporal dimension. So we can see this is kind of a blend between surface rendering, volume rendering, representation of the solution, which is very tricky business, by the way, because in general, these solutions to the wave equations uh, uh, in, in higher temporal dimensions are not well posed. These are ultra-hyperbolic equations, but under certain non-local constraints, these equations can be solved, and, and it leads to, to, to very, very natural uh, representation. So again, I'm not going to go uh, over this, but we, we, we've proven that under certain situations, these equations exist, uh, and so forth. So, so here is one example that I want to show you. Look, um, the notion of the phase of time is very a bit counterintuitive because we cannot see it, we cannot perceive it, it's difficult to measure it. It's exactly the same phenomenon as we do when we sample. And you know, I teach my students very often, uh, what does it mean to sample from a distribution? And this is again an animation that we did a number of years ago. We have a publication on it that demonstrates the central, that demonstrates the first and second fundamental laws of probability through simulation. So, you know, uh, obviously most of you guys know, know what, is it, what it means to sample from a given distribution. In this app, you can actually go ahead and, um, and the, the link is over here, just like I showed you. If there is interest at the end, I, I can show you guys how this thing work in, works in practice. But you basically draw from this distribution and then you make some inference about the sampling distribution of a statistic of interest, like the mean or the variance or the kurtosis, something like this. Well, exactly the same thing happens when you, when you sample, when you take a large sample, that's exactly why people take large samples because you a large sample is guaranteed to cover the distribution domain, okay? And that's what we're gonna be doing in the phase space. Now, now the phase space is uh, periodic, right? It goes from minus pi to pi, okay? And we are gonna be randomly sampling, as you can see right now in the next slide, I'm gonna show you how we sample from three different distributions. One is completely, unbiased, it has an expectation of zero. One is positively biased, its expectation is pi over five. And one that is negatively biased, it has expectation, the red one, of minus pi over three. So on this next slide, I'm um, uh, effectively showing how this thing happens. So here I'm randomly walking through space and time, okay? So uh, I am uh, um, walking through the um, space kind manifold, these two-dimensional manifold, where the size of my, these projection rays coming out of the center, their magnitude is our time. This tells me at what longitudinal order position was the observation taken, and its orientation of the ray tells me the phase. So you can see as we keep sampling from this space, I can reconstruct the three different distributions uh, in this periodic uh, phase domain. All right, so there's a lot of open math problems. We're not gonna go over them. I just wanted to uh, point out here. Okay, so now what I wanna do is, okay, so this is all nice and dandy. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of symbols, a lot of uh, analytical expressions. Uh, how does this help me with data analytics? Let me just uh, uh, quickly break up here and see if, if there is any questions or comments uh, from the audience because it is difficult sometimes to see uh, the chat. Um, no, I lost the chat somewhere. Okay, I don't see any posts, but again, for if, if anybody joined a little bit later, um, there. Okay, Mar Marcy just posted. There is a link to the to the uh, slides if anybody wants to see. So I don't see, and I certainly don't hear any questions. Uh, can I just get a confirmation at least from somebody that uh, audio and video and uh, screen sharing uh, are projecting well? Everything's working great, sir. Everything looks great. Thank you. All right. So let, let's press on then. So now what we want to do is we want to translate some of these mathematical physics into practical data science. So we're going to draw parallels between particles and objects, observable quantities, and features, states of particles and datum for an individual data point, particle systems and problems or data systems. And the most important one for us to kind of realize is the translation of wave functions into inference functions. 
And now, the wave functions there are very important, okay? They essentially describe the state of, uh, of, of various systems, okay? Inference functions, of course, in data science are very important because they lead from you feeding data into a wave function and it outputs some kind of a, a decision, right? It, it outputs some kind of a prediction, forecast, class label, derived phenotype, you know, something like this. So this is the most important, if you remember anything from this talk, I guess, the translation from mathematical physics from wave functions to inference functions is the ones that we're going to be capitalizing on substantially here. And there's obviously some other ones as well. J just to give you one very practical example, suppose I uh, look in mathematical physics at solving the wave equation. Now, there is a very uh, clearly well-defined solution. It's called the wave function uh, or a traveling wave that can be expressed, mind you, exactly in the same format, a magnitude times um, Euler's formula for, for expressing this um, uh, inner product between the, uh, the, uh, the, the k space variables and the space time variables. Now, this, so, so the, the wave function, that solution to that problem uh, in, in our case, in data science, would be the inference function. I'll give you just two examples. A very simple generalized linear model where you have a data set O, uh, observable, that has predictors and an outcome Y. And then what you're looking for is you're looking for finding, for instance, the ordinary least squares solution of this specific linear equation. And, and uh, you know, so, so here is our model. I have a model. I have some data, I plug it in, and then my, my inference function of wave function, the inference function assessed at that data observable object is effectively translated through that formula into actionable information. Now for this effect size beta estimate vector, I can tell you, you know, I can com com compute its variability, I can compute its likelihood not to be zero, and from there, I can do a test statistic and find out how important, in a statistical sense, is the effect of every one of the predictors on the outcome. Another nonlinear example kind of you know, suggests something very similar with support vector machine classification, where you do a, a lifting of this um, uh, process from a low dimensional R eta space to an R D space, where D is much higher than eta. And then uh, exactly the same thing here, your inference function is effectively a representation of the observables, so some kind of an analytical representation of the observables based on which you can actually derive border lines between points to separate and, and induce these support vector machine classification that comes with uh, these kinds of uh, studies. So, all right, so uh, assuming we have all of these things, we are gonna be doing very similar strategies of what people are doing in crystallography, where people try to identify the structure of very, very small crystals. Uh, and, and they expose them to very high energy particles and look in the background at the uh, diffraction pattern. But what they can only observe in the diffraction pattern is the magnitude. They're missing the phases, exactly what we have with our space time uh, data. We observe time perfectly. We can measure now, a second later, a second later, a second later. We can measure that perfectly. But we cannot quite tease out what is the phase, how do I represent and uh, uh, track the phase representation. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing various tricks using transformations like the, the, the Fourier transformation, the Laplace transformation, and various other transformations to estimate these unknown, unobservable phases, and then reconstruct the data into the data analytic space through various um, uh, uh, discrete or continuous transformations. All right, so j just to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea here, so in this specific example, um, suppose this is the correct image that I'm trying to reconstruct, two examples, two rows, Cyrillic alphabet image and, and uh, English alphabet image, and then if I try to reconstruct these by completely ignoring the phases, I get two, uh, two images that, you know, they, they, kind of, they don't have human readable textual representation. And if you swap the phases, if you use the English character phases to reconstruct the Cyrillics, you see the blend that you get between the two alphabets. 
And exactly the same thing in the opposite case where you use the magnitudes of the English alphabet image, but you pair them up with the Cyrillic phases and you reconstruct them, the image back into a, a space time domain. So here is an example of, uh, of an fMRI image. So, so these are simply three different time points. The one on the bottom is time one, the one in the middle is time two, and the one on the top is time three. And I'm just looking at a two-dimensional cross axial transverse cross-section of the brain. And, and that's what they look like, kind of reconstructed as a, as a surface representation. So uh, this is an image that I showed you before, again, ignoring completely the kind phases. So, so, so reconstructing time by using a zero phase kind of gives you um, a longitudinal kind of a perspective vision iso surfaces that look like this. When in reality, if you do the perfect reconstruction, there is a lot more detail that's embedded in the um, corresponding ice surface. So you can imagine that some of the statistics that you're going to be deriving using this representation or that representation may be the same, but they certainly will not be identical. All right, so we're, we're, approaching, uh, we're approaching here uh, uh, at 12.27, uh, so it's probably a good idea for me to stop with this and I'll go into the hands-on uh, demo phase. One important thing, this is kind of the last thing that I'm going to show you. Um, Remember, we're going to be looking at data that varies with time. And we like to think of it because it's very intuitive for humans, right? I want to see the trajectory of the time course. I mean, think about stock market. Think about people's vital signs. Uh, think, think about, you know, I don't know, COVID right now. You, you've all seen how people have graphed and plotted. So, so these time courses are, are essentially time, uh, time series. When you pair these things up with the phases, these automatically become kind surfaces, where a projection, a cross section with a plane of these kind surfaces yields precisely a curve that looks like a, like a time series. So that's what we're gonna be doing over. And now, uh, before I forget, you know, I obviously have to uh, recognize, before I switch into the transition slides, because I probably will forget to do this at the end, you know, a lot of my students and colleagues have contributed to this. Uh, my co-author, Milan Valef at Burgas Technical University is a key player. The soccer lab, we have some grants and a lot of colleagues here from, from the University of Michigan. So let's, let's go ahead now and um, if my screen is still visible, I'm gonna go back to now to, to kind of doing the demonstration. So I'm gonna try to go full screen here. Let's see. Uh, Okay, Marcy posted something. That's good, thank you. All right, so uh, this is the, the website that I put together specifically for this presentation. Again, the, the, the slides are over here. You can always uh, get them and, and see how that works. So let's go over now to, to the space kind. If you just type space kind, space kind with a K, K for, for complex. So you're gonna get to this page where, you know, it kind of gives you the, the splash screen, the, fr the front page kind of tells you a little bit about what is this all about, how do these things, these concepts uh, arise in practice? And a little bit about this notion. Um, we, we give a number of examples here. Okay, this is a cool example. The, 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 does the animation pop out actually look uh, okay on your screen? I'm not sure if you can actually see the, the, spinning, the spinning surface with, 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 yes. a, with a projection. Looks good. Okay, Looks good. so you see, I have actually intersected the kind surface that we used to reconstruct the data in these high dimensional space, when I cross section it with a plane, and this is of course idealized kind surface, right? This is a model base, this is not real data. But you can see the blue line and the red line are two different, you can think of these as two different cases, two different patients under exactly the same condition, under exactly the same experimental uh, situation. Now, so the red and the blue one represent what we and obviously their heights represent the time series intensities, and the radial positioning, how far away they are from the center, is the time longitudinal order. Now, the most interesting part for us, however, is going to be the angular momentum or the phase of time. Okay? So we're going to be putting these things together, and we're going to be go going from, let's say, a thousand individuals for which we have these time courses, into a single representation of that process in space time 
as a manifold, which obviously is going to have very intricate geometry, topology, curvature, and all kinds of other characteristics that are not visible to you, if you simply look at cross-sections, it's exactly the same problem as try to reconstruct the exact three-dimensional shape of my hand by looking at the projection from a light source on a back screen, right? This is a very difficult uh, imposed inverse problem that cannot be solved perfectly. Obviously, there are computational ways to solve that. So, so we're going to be doing something, some, something very similar here. Here is another animation of the same thing. And, 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 and this is kind of yet another one that kind of shows you different ways that these kind of surfaces can actually show up in practice. So, uh, you know, so now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the technical details. So this link here uh, is going to lead us now to the actual demonstrations. Now, for those of you that are interested, um, if you just uh, go to our uh, GitHub site on the soccer website, uh, the, the GitHub, uh, github.com slash soccer, statistics online computational resource, here is the TCU package. We have a whole bunch of packages and uh, software releases. As you can see, this specific one, as it says here, is an R package, right? Uh, and you, you, you can download it either from here, okay? And, you know, we go through the detail and, and, and we show you how to run demos and, and how to um, uh, implement it and so forth. And you can also um, uh, find the, the rec, uh, if you do CRAN, TCIU, uh, it's going to get you directly to the, um, if you're in uh, R notebook, you, you know, if you have R, you, you, you can download it and, and you can see all the vignettes that we have here. We have documentation, we have, uh, you know, other things that are, that are listed over here, version control and, and the description and all these things. So I'm not, I'm not going to go over these things. Everybody knows how to, how to read these things. There was a recent release that was done. And so forth. So I'm going to kind of focus a little bit on the on the technical because we have about 10, 15 minutes. I want to show you hands-on uh, what really happens. Okay. So let, let's go back to here. Okay. So uh, on the main website, um, you know, you, you you can look at some of these. Uh, for example, we have a, a few interactive links that that kind of walk you through uh, the, the whole process. So here is, uh, for instance, um, uh, a very interesting data set that we have uh, looked at uh, that allows you to interactively see the different characteristics, uh, in this case, of the, uh, of the data. And then what, what you can do is uh, you can do, obviously, forecasting, right? So you, 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 you um, use the first uh, 20 or so years, 30 years of observations, and then you pro prospectively forecast you prospectively forecast the, the behavior of this time series. And this is simply a, a slight zoomification here where you, you can actually track both confidence limits and, and predictions of the forward-looking time series and compare it to the, uh, to the actual um, uh, uh, prospective data. So the green color indicates what we train on. Uh, the red color is the um, uh, ARIMA forecast. And then that is based on space time, and then and then you have confidence limits uh, that are 80 or 90 percent, uh, and so forth. So this is a very simplistic example. So here we've actually looked at the distribution of the of, of those phases. Okay, this is the distribution from minus pi to pi again for different variables. It's not really important as much what the data is as uh, realizing that these phases are symmetric distributions typically. And if you recall earlier, when I sampled from the uh, from the from the circular uh, periodic distribution, I, I had one example where the distribution was, you know, a, a positively biased, one negative biased, and one that was um, uh, unbiased. Uh, so, so the code for all of these examples is, is included over here. And again, we can do forecasts using this. And now um, in the next uh, section, what I can uh, show for you is perhaps, um, if you scroll up to here, I, I want to show you this uh, interactive plot, right? That you can, um, earlier I, I showed you the, uh, okay, that's interesting. Sometimes Firefox 
um, sometimes Firefox um, plays these games. So let, let, let's just quickly um, switch gears and, and go to Chrome. I need to restart Firefox to, to make this thing work. So what I'm going to do uh, quickly is I'm just going to go to Chrome, uh, which never fails you, they say. Um, and I am going to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I meant first to show this interactive plot that, that we saw a little bit earlier. Again, I want everybody hopefully to understand the notion that these black curves represent instantiations of experimental observations just tracked through time. The entire surface reconstruction represents the corresponding process in its entirety, right? Now, obviously, if you sample long enough, if you, have, if you sample 2,000 individuals under exactly the same experimental conditions, you're going to have 2,000 of these radio curves projecting over that space, and then you can use these 2,000 curves to reconstruct the, the corresponding single time surface representation of your data. Uh, OK. So this is an interesting uh, example now. It takes a little bit. And this is, by the way, an R notebook. Uh, most of you are familiar with notebooks. So I'm not going to go over the details. If I zoom in a little bit, OK, it's going to show me that this this is kind of really a hands-on tutorial, you guys. It, it, it starts with what is, what are the Laplace transforms uh, in terms of a discrete and continuous. Uh, how do you do path integration in a complex plane? Then it defines the continuous Laplace transform, and then it shows uh, specific examples, including an fMRI example. So, so that's the content of the activity. And I'm just going to walk you through some of the interesting examples. So this Laplace transform, you see, takes in a function which is just like a, a time series is a function, a mapping, that takes in the positive reals into some kind of a vector space. For example, the complex plane, the real line, and so forth. This is what a time series is. Now, imagine me applying the Laplace transform to this function. Okay? The Laplace transform allows me to complexify the domain of the function. So all of a sudden, the Laplace transform is a function in the two-dimensional time space. Now, it's a complicated function, granted, OK? It's a complicated function, complex value, complex argument, complex domain, complex range, OK? And its inverse Laplace transform is well-defined as well by this specific integral. So we, we know how to go back and forth. But the question is, let's look at some examples, all right? So let's start with a very simple function, OK? Suppose you have a function um, that is uh, effectively you know, represented as 1 over z squared. So suppose this is the Laplace transform. This, this is my time surface, OK? Then this inverts back as a time series just as t. So give me a time, and I tell you what the intensity of the signal at time t is. It's just t itself. So obviously, everybody sees that this is a kind of silly time series, right? It's essentially a linearly increasing time series. A simple function, a simple time series. More complicated function, more complicated time series, right? Uh, does everybody see the, the analogy here? So, so we can go back and forth between these time surfaces that, are, that I've been showing you some examples and animations from and uh, the corresponding time se series that everybody is looking into. Now, and we go through some validation here. So uh, let, let's go ahead and, and, and look at uh, some of these examples done uh, uh, pragmatically here, OK? So I'm going to take now a little bit of more interesting example, OK? Suppose you're, you're looking at, at a function that kind of looks like this. Now I may have to zoom out a little bit to get, OK? This for me, maybe I can minimize this. OK, that kind of works. OK, this barely, but it works. So this is a more, this is a more interesting time surface, OK? Does everybody see? It, it essentially consists of four components that are mixed together with equal weights. Now, does it have to be this function? No. But I want to see what is the corresponding time course that yields this specific time surface representation. And of course, each of these functions individually, I can, I can transform 
into the time domain, as you can see, right? So this, for example, time surface corresponds to the trigonometric function sine of x. This component of the time surface corresponds to a, a exponential. This one and so forth, right? So, so, so I know what the exact analytical things are. And then, of course, you guys remember we, we, we have various formulas that allow us to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to process, you know, if, if you take Laplace transform of linear combination, multiplication translates into convolution, addition is preserved, and all that business. So I can analytically actually derive the exact model for my time series. It's going to look like this a linear term, an exponential term, and a trigonometric term, right? And then I am going to actually visualize this kind of surface that's over here, this kind of surface. I'm going to be visualizing it as, as projections, right? You can imagine these, these kind of surfaces that I've been showing you. I can actually go ahead and, and project them in a two-dimensional space and just show you the contour plot, the isosurfaces. If you want to call them topological maps, whatever you want to call them, to, um, uh, to, to, to do this. And then, okay, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to make up my mind how much zooming I want here. And then I want to go ahead and actually visualize this. This is what, I'm sorry, this looks kind of in standard LaTeX format, but this is the function that we are visualizing here. That's what, that's what the kind, this is what a realistic, analytical time surface represents. It's got some points of singularities, obviously, because they've got Zs on the denominator, okay? That's kind of natural. Uh, but that's what the time surface looks like, right? I hope everybody here is with me and can see this animation. Then what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be asking the question, what is the corresponding time series? What's an instance of a corresponding time series that, that is in one-to-one -one mapping with this specific time surface? And then what we're going to do is, of course, we're going to be applying the inverse Laplace transform, okay? And then this is the corresponding time series, okay? Just the real part, because it, it, it will be complex value to you guys. But the real part looks like this. Now, is this an interesting time series? Maybe, maybe not. But again, this kind of shows you the, uh, the, the, um, me the mechanics of going back and forth between observable time series quantities and reconstructions in a higher dimensional space that we call kind surfaces. Because ultimately, remember, I wanna do the analytics on the kind surfaces. They're very rich structures that, that include uh, information that's not visible when you're looking at this specific time course here. Okay, and here is another example where the, um, the, the original uh, uh, time surface is the magnitude of Z, okay? And turns out that the corresponding time series is monotonically increasing with time, okay? Here is yet, yet another example that kind of shows this specific uh, time surface here. Again, it corresponds to this specific um, uh, reconstruction, okay? Uh, and it's actually, it's actually this specific function, sine of 2t. Sine of 2t, okay, obviously well, this is a function with period of pi, as everybody see, from zero to pi, because I have 2t. So if I were to ask myself, suppose my time series is sine of 2t, what is gonna be the corresponding time surface? It's visualized right up here, right? All right, so, so, so these are some examples, and we can do these things in, in fairly good ways. Um, uh, I want to get back down to, uh, okay, and, and, and here is the, the function sign. We can smooth these things. We, we, can, we can reconstruct them. And you can see that they, um, their reconstructions, albeit not perfect, they, they can be uh, represented fairly accurately. All right. So, and here is one example where we actually have two of these kind of surfaces superimposed on top of each other. Now, I would like to get down to the situation where we actually look at some real fMRI data. All right. So here's an fMRI example. I, I showed you a few uh, snapshots earlier of, of fMRI data. So remember, it's, it's four-dimensional, okay? So the first thing, and I've got, I've got, uh, the code is kind of hidden here, but if you guys click the code, uh, and by the way, by the way, 
uh, I invite everybody to go ahead and try this. I, I've released the data. You guys can actually look at the data. The data is available on the software server. Everything that I'm showing you here is either completely functional or it doesn't exist. I, this is not slight. This is the real deal. Now, if you want, I can actually open my uh, our notebook and show you how this thing works in practice. But basically, you point your uh, our environment to the source of the data. You download it locally uh, uh, using these two commands. Then you interpret it as a nifty three-dimensional, nifty compressed file. It's of these spatial dimensions, uh, the, the, the spatial step sizes, these specific spatial dimensions. So I have 180 temporal uh, temporal time points, and the spatial domain is 64 by 64 by 21 um, axially. And then what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just, you know, for the sake of, uh, of a demonstration, we're going to extract the time course of just one voxel location, the one that's kind of in the middle of the volume, remember? So I'm going to pick 20, 20, and 11. I kind of pick a, a random, not really a random, but uh, uh, one location in, in, in the volume, and I'm going to look at its entire time course. So uh, I will uh, smooth it out a little bit because fMRI series are notoriously noisy. The signal to noise ratio is less than 4%. These are incredibly difficult data to, uh, to analyze. And I'm just going to go ahead and plot them. So as you can see, roughly speaking, what are we talking about for a single voxel location? And I have many tens of thousands of these voxel locations that span the entire brain. So here is the data, right? Time one, time two, time three, time four. It kind of dances around quite noisy. I smoothed it out just to show you a little bit of the behavior because there is something behind this signal that drives that up and down. Most of it is noise, but some of it is due to the underlying experimental design of stimulus, stimulus, rest, stimulus, rest. So this is called event-related design where uh, there is obviously a little bit more complicated that there is uh, hemodynamic response functions and all kinds of other things that come into play. But I'm interested now in eyeballing this and asking myself, what is the corresponding time surface representation for that time series? So we're going to use the Laplace transform, for instance. There is these other ways that I'm not going to talk about right now. I'm, I'm not going to have time. But I'm, I'm going to pipe this through uh, the uh, Laplace transform. And here is my reconstruction. Here is my um, univariate longitudinal time series as an object that has now two time dimensions. One is the, um, uh, the direction, the kind of phase, which kind of goes around. And one is the radius from the origin, which is called the time that we have. Okay, So that's what this fMRI series looks like as a kind of surface. Now, just to validate this, I want to apply the inverse Laplace transform and pull it back into the time domain and confirm that this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. I mean, everybody would agree with me that I need to do this. Now, it's not a perfect reconstruction, as you can see here, depending upon how you do it. Remember, the, the, the original signal is this blue curve. The reconstruction is the, the, the green curve. And then a slightly smoothed version of this, as it says up here, smooth reconstruction is red. The raw reconstruction is green. And the original smoothed version of the fMRI is the blue one. So it's not a perfect reconstruction, but you have to imagine that there's a lot of numerical integration and numerical solutions that come into play that kind of cause that slight discrepancy between uh, the fits. And we are currently, right now as we speak, we're, we're working into, uh, into um, uh, figuring out how to do this thing better. Uh, now, in the remaining uh, five minutes or so, um, it's probably worth it showing uh, this example. Um, sorry, not this one. Okay, so here. The example that I want to show is the following. It's still loading. Just bear with me. This is, you know, this is real science. I'm doing a live uh, demonstration for you guys, and, and it's going to take a little bit of time. Uh, 
Let me zoom out a little bit so that I can see, uh, you see the, 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 the table of contents here so that I can quickly navigate to the, to the uh, right plot. So here is the first thing that I want to do, OK? So the first thing I want to do is I want to look at the entire data set, OK? Now, remember, uh, this is just, uh, uh, you know, axial sagittal. This is axial sagittal and coronal cross sections of the fMRI data. And here is just one location, 40, 30, and then, um, and then this is, uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what this value is. And then it's, here is the corresponding time course. So that's what I'm going to be looking at. Now, for this time course, I'm going to be, remember, I have 180 observations. I'm only going to use the first 130 to learn the pattern. And then I'm going to be forecasting using my space time analytics approach. Okay. So here is what you get at the end once you apply this um, into the three-dimensional data. In this specific case, I have a very interesting data set that involves finger, finger tapping. Okay. And it's done both on the, uh, with left and right hand. And you can see that precisely, if you look at the side of the brain, precisely the somatosensory motor area of the brain, and a lot of other sporadic noise is available, right? So for example, there is some in the vestibular ocular in the cerebellum here, right? So some voxels are showing statistical activation in, in the back of the brain. But the bulk, the bulk of, these, uh, of, of these statistically significant regions are precisely near the cortex in the somatosensory area. So I'm kind of happy to see that, right? And if I scroll down and do a post hoc test, okay, using uh, using uh, 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 using false discovery rate, I can remove most of these sporadic activations, and I'm going to kind of have a more focused representation precisely as to where the activation occurred uh, in space. So you see, bring the mouse over kind of tells you exactly how significant it is. I can only show the most significant regions if I want to. I can show some of the less significant regions, right, et cetera. So, so, so you, you can toggle on and off uh, with our software and only show uh, some, of the, some of the most significantly one, important voxels, right? Okay. Now, I can also do cross uh, cross-sectional views of these. As you can see here, axial, sagittal, and coronal. You can do contour uh, plot plots with these things. Um, and then you can also uh, uh, compare the p-values. OK? Uh, you can compare the p-values between uh, different uh, 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 schemas. And then ultimately now, what we want to do is we want to look at what regions. Remember, it's not really voxel-based morphology that we're doing here. We want to be able to find out which brain areas. See, this is, for example, superior, right superior frontal gyrus. This is the left superior frontal gyrus, et cetera. So left middle front, frontal gyrus and so forth. So, so we have an atlas for the brain, right? And I want to know, I want to do a two-level statistical analysis. I know it's 1254 and people are probably dying to go and grab their lunch. So I, I went, I promise you, in just a couple of seconds. But we can do a statistical analysis and find out which regions of the brain are, are activated with this specific task. So you see, we can do ROI, region of interest-based analysis in addition to the voxel-based analysis. And then we can subset, we can apply a second level analysis only on the activated regions, right? So, so I can limit the scope. And then obviously we, we can find statistical significance in the time domain once we've done the space time reconstruction. So it's probably the best thing for me is to stop here and see if there is any questions or comments that I, that I may be able to, uh, to address. Uh, I'm just trying to go back to um, to the regular Zoom uh, and see if, if anybody has any comments. Read the chat. Again, if you're interested in uh, m most of the stuff is available on the website as well as on GitHub. All of this is fully reproducible. We, we just recently re-ran the entire uh, notebook uh, materials. You know, we, we have vignettes that are available online. And, uh, you know, and we're, we're still working on the science. So there's a lot of open problems. If there are students on the call that might be interested in, in, some, of that, uh, in some of that science, 
uh, shoot me an email, we can chat and see uh, where we can get to this. Thanks very much for joining. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much, Evo. That was a really nice talk. Thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll stay on the call for a couple of minutes just to see if anybody has any questions. If not, uh, again, thanks for joining. Evo, this is really fascinating work. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around exactly what <clears throat> this um, these space kind of manifolds represent. So <clears throat> um, if I understand correctly, <clears throat> um you're, you're sort of unrolling the one dimension of time into two dimensions do the two dimensions have any um intuitive interpretations or is it sort of collectively the two-dimensional space represents the variation yeah so 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 this is a great question uh let me see if, if, if that might uh, be a good explanation imagine you guys if we are trying to make a decision, we are trying to come to some kind of a consensus about the university reopening in winter of 2021. Now, um, we gather, so suppose we gather uh, surveys on a weekly basis for all the faculty. And I've got, let's say, for the sake of the argument, suppose we have 10,000 faculty. Each faculty is gonna respond on this questionnaire across time, and we're gonna gather the data. So at every one fixed point in time, week, not, week zero, the baseline, week one, week two, week three, et cetera, the measurements of every faculty's response at that week are going to represent, are going to be randomly sampled on this circle of the phases where at a given phase, it's some kind of a faculty's perception about the opinion of whether or not, let's say binary, should I open or not, zero or one, okay? Uh, and then longitudinally, these opinions are going to are going to change. So everyone's trajectory across time is going to span different phases. But if I put all of these things together, it will represent a single time surface, which I can then make projections at every one point in time. I can, for instance, very simply, uh, suppose we take ten week survey. So my time surface only expands radially up to ten, and it stops. But having the surface, you see, I can project, I can extrapolate the behavior of the surface outside of the actual observational range. Now, if you want to know where is the majority of the faculty standing at any one point in time, outside of the survey area, you see, what we need to do is we need to come up with some kind of a consensus. These consensuses represent, you know, characteristics like the mean faculty response, I don't know, median, it could be, I don't know, how, you know, how dispersed our opinions are and whatnot. So, so in other words, the, if we have a random sample, if we have a random sample, this random sample is guaranteed to span the circular distribution of the phases. And the argument is that we can make a better inference or prediction or even at the at, at the final point in time we can have a, a, a better consensus about what is the opinion of the faculty than simply taking the, the mean response of you know 53 percent of the faculty said open 47 percent said close you know something like this so so, so in other words uh, we, we're, we're generalizing we're we're uh, increasing the dimensionality a little bit which comes with a lot of gorp as you can see the approximations are not perfect there is a lot of numerical processing that happens. But ultimately, the goal is to be able to model these processes, time surfaces, and then do forecasting, do what we call phase aggregation, which is build consensus for, from all the observations into what is the real state of the system. In other words, what's the real uh, public opinion about, uh, about reopening. So I'm not sure. Maybe this was the obfuscated answer. But um, in a way, we we're trying to think of the phases as being almost like randomly sampling from the distribution of an unknown uh, process. I see. <clears throat> um, that's that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> can you give a concrete example of a type of um, 
phenomena that you can discover in the phase space that you can't on the in the one D time axis? Yeah, this is this is a good, a good question. So let, let me see if I can show you here in the applications. We didn't get to the applications, um, but uh, let's see. In this air quality. Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay, <laughs> okay. This is this is still not uh, up to date. So uh, let me just see. Oh, you know, we we, we haven't gotten these things posted yet. Um, we we have looked. Uh, let me just see if I can switch back to the no. In the PowerPoint, I do have some examples. Um, if you just bear with me for a second, right up here. So let, 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 let me see. So in this in this slide here, I'm showing you. Uh, this is uh, UC Irvine uh, air quality data set. You know, 10,000 hourly uh, carbon monoxide observations across time. We're kind of decomposing them here into the harmonics, 14 different harmonics kind of overlaid. Obviously, the first harmonic is just the average. The second harmonic is the lowest frequency. And as you go up in the order, they get more detail added to the system. So what we did here is we fit in uh, autoregressive integrated moving average model with exogenous variables. And it turns out that this model on the perfect data set uh, it has a PD and Q of 114. If we ignore completely the phases, we're going to get a, a different ARIMA model, okay, with slightly different coefficients. And if we replace all the phases with a single value of a phase which represents the average phase, why the average? Well, because remember, if I don't have the phase distribution, a simple univariate characterization of it is what is its mean? So I'm taking the average of the phases that I that I obtained by reconstructing the signal into the Fourier domain, and I replace the unknown here uh, uh, phase estimate, uh, the new phase, by the average, just one number. The model becomes two, zero, and three, certainly not perfect, but look at how much better this model is with a single additional piece of information about the average phase, not the distribution of the phases, the average phase, it captures some of these moving averages that were completely ignored uh, in, in the model that, that completely ignores the phase. Uh, also, some of these coefficients, even if the uh, exogenous variables are present in the other model, the model with a little bit of additional phase information gets much closer to the estimate of this coefficient in the true model. So, so I'm not sure if this kind of resonates with people, but again, so we can show examples where very the most simple of all phase estimation strategies, an average measure, does a lot better than completely uh, ignoring the phase. And there's obviously more elaborate ways of modeling the phase, but I, but I wanted to have here one example that kind of illustrates that, that simple thing. And we have, we have some other examples uh, that, that I can point you out using more advanced methods, uh, for example, uh, using uh, decision trees and so forth. So at a high level, um, the phase space allows you to capture some kind of covariance that the one dimensional time axis is not as obvious. Is, is exactly, that the idea? exactly. Yeah. Right. Interesting. I would love to chat about um, whether this might be applicable to um, time series genomic data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let, 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 let's touch base offline and see and see how it goes, Josh. Thanks. Anyone else? Uh... Okay, there's there's only a few of us left anyway. So, uh, oh, there was a chat posting. Okay, <laughs> tour de force. Yes. Uh, sorry, Gil. I, I know that this is. Uh... Uh, this was difficult, I know, but uh, uh, see, if I had only done the demos, it's very easy to do the demos. It, it's going to be. I know it's impressive. That's a positive statement. Very positive okay. statement. Okay. So. Thank, thank you. you. All right, everyone. Well, thanks very much again. I appreciate your joining and uh, listening for an hour during lunch. Thank you, Ivo. You all have a good. Right, well. Okay.